What we're going to do over the next half hour is we've got two panels with our growth companies. So in the startup program, uh, we have eight growth companies. You may have seen um, four here, and there's four that are going to be on in 15 minutes, um, pitching earlier on today at 9.45. So those companies have each raised between 3 and 10 million, and they have definitely got lessons from their experience that they can apply or teach you with, uh, you know, by telling their stories, you can hopefully get some takeaways um, that you can then apply uh, in, in your journeys as you, as you grow in your careers as well. Um, so the, the title of this first panel is How to Secure Your First Round of Funding. And it's going to be a quick fire panel. Um, and each startup is going to be basically take three to four minutes to um, sort of take a thought leadership angle and summarize. Um, or I'm going to ask them each a question. They're going to tell us a story. And, um, and then I'm going to pass it on to, to the next startup. So without further ado, because I know we've got 15 minutes, let me introduce them on one by one. Um, firstly, we've got Blue Code. Christian from Blue Code. Blue Code is the first pan-European mobile payment solution uh, enabling cashless payments on mobile. Christian? Thanks, Christian. Take a seat. Awesome. Now we have Amplify. Amplify is an AI-driven platform reshaping business intelligence and research on a global scale. <laughs> Looks like it's going to be quite tight on this sofa. <laughs> Um, excellent. Now we have Risk. Uh, Risk is a company making insurance so simple that it's unrecognizable. Their words, not mine, but I believe you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nimesh from Risk. Finally, last but not least, we have Paybase. Jesse. Jesse um, has told me that Paybase is the most flexible payment solution for platform businesses. So Jesse, looking forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Christian's taking the, the casual angle. Maybe I'll it here as well. Well, hello, good <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> well, the question was about fundraising, how to raise your first funds. The most important thing that I found out at Blue Code was to keep close contact with all the people you have talked to over the months since you started. Because you may not realize, but they have given you time. They've given you time to listen to your story. And if you really write that down, you will find that if you approach those people half a year later, and they still remember your story, you will be probably a target for them, and they may be the right investor for you. So the advice I can give on that is start early and give really attention to what you tell your counterparts and reflect on that. So as you were kind of, um, as you, you had your list being kind of built over time, uh, were, you, were you nurturing those investors that you had in your list? Were you updating them? Were you updating the investors before you even were starting to reach out to them, telling that you were raising a round? Were you kind of sending them um, you know, monthly updates or quarterly updates? It's a very good question. I mean, you don't want to succumb potential investors with information they do not want. So the best thing is to ask them if, you wa if they want you to send them on a regular basis some information or some milestones that you have achieved that you have talked to them about. So I would not advise to send to anyone you have spoken to um, milestones and um, comments about where the state of your company is. I rather would go very selective and really ask what people expect from you going forward and if they think that like Blue Code would be a potential investment target for them. And, and so did you have a, a well-built network already prior to Blue Code or did you kind of really have to nurture that and you know, come to events like this, and uh, did you do some cold outreach as well to, to, to continue to build that list? Well, funnily enough, being a mobile payment scheme like Blue Code, we had a couple of, I would say, frenemies, like the credit card companies. So we looked at who was talking to them, who might be interested in talking to us. So we have to take a little bit more of a strategic approach, saying who is actually interested in this sector, who looks at fintech, who looks at payment specifically, and from there, you learn a lot who can become your investor. And actually, we were approached by a couple of um, now existing investors if we would talk to them and explain our mission. So we were quite lucky, so to say. And we found out the more we work with potential clients, the luckier we get. That makes sense. And um, just to come to you, Jesse. Um, I know that Paybase is obviously um, also in the fintech space. So I'd like to just pose that question to you as well. You know, 
just co sort of comparing or contrasting to what Christian said, how did you um, at Paybase start kind of building that list out of, of, of investors and, and how did you start contacting them and building those relationships? Yes, so from a, what, the first thing that we did, we identified the criteria that we were um, looking for from an investor perspective. So we were looking for investors that were interested in tech companies or payment companies or investors that could actually understand the specific business model that we are, that we are following, which is transaction-based. Also investors that um, understood the business model of our clients, which is also quite specific, as we are targeting online marketplaces. And having an investor that actually understands their business model was also useful. And, and, and also investors that were obviously interested in the stage of funding that we were at. So that was the, the, the first thing that we did. So we put together a spreadsheet that was quite extensive with all of their contact details, there's what they specialized in, and, and more or less of a time frame as to when we think we should contact these guys. Um, another thing that we did to build up that list was to go to a lot of networking events. Um, and, and something that is a bit more innovative, um, as part of our marketing strategy, one of the things that we do, we, we host events, and one of our, the events that we hosted for our clients was about raising funds. Obviously, we are a startup as well, so raising funds is also interesting for us. Therefore, we had a panel of VCs at our own events that were there to talk to our clients, but that gave us, you know, a, 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 well, easy way of talking to these four VCs that were obviously interested in, in, in us as well, because we were capable of hosting an event with 40 clients in a room as a young startup. So that was a really good way as well of getting a free ticket with these, with these VCs. Awesome, and I know that um, obviously you're the CMO at Paybase, right? So um, this is a question I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose to Amplify as well, but I wanted to start with you. Um, how did you, er, so early on in, in a fundraising journey when you know, so much of what you're talking about is in the future, and it's, you know, a lot of stuff is it's not yet reality. You're saying, we're going to achieve this, we're going to achieve this. How, like, how closely did you work with um, the, other, the founding team and you know, your colleagues uh, to make your vision, to align the marketing um, story with the vision that they were selling to the investors? Well, I think the, the key thing when you start, when you're an early stage business, it's really to define your, your, your vision, your mission, which is why would you do what you do, how are you gonna do it, and what are you gonna do? and also align on your positioning. Once that's clear um, as a business, it's a lot easier for the founders to go up to investors and really, um, well, tell them what it is. Um, so often for founders, it's a bit vague and having this sort of workshop with the team where with the structure that is needed, sort of brainstorming session, that was really, really useful for them as well. Excellent, and Amplify, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about um, how you did that, how you articulated that vision so early on. Yeah, you sure. And, and it is when you're starting off and you don't have um, the market traction, you, you need to convince people. And particularly for the investors, you've got to think like an investor at times, I suppose, and de-risk it from, from their perspective. So for, for us, we, we actually knew the marketplace incredibly well. Um, we knew the pain point from the inside, actually, because most of us had come from... So we're targeting large corporations. Large, many of us had come from large corporations. So, so we understood their pain point inside out. Um, that gave us the drive and passion, actually, to, to be so convinced that what we have is going to solve that problem. So when we were talking to investors, that vision and mission w was so much easier to convey because we weren't second-guessing what the marketplace wanted. We'd actually been there, we'd understood it, and we could articulate that very well to the, uh, to the investors. Awesome. And, and um, obviously, the, the fundraising journey can uh, vary hugely in terms of how long it, how long it goes on for. Um, but what you want to ultimately do is build the business, right? So um, I'm just going to pose a question to you, Namesh, uh, at risk. How did you guys strike a balance between um, diligence and efficiency and basically getting that deal closed so that you could c get back to building risk? I think, I think it would be wrong of me to say that we had a, a, a prescriptive, you know, a prescription of doing that because, quite frankly, it is really, really hard to raise capital and it always takes longer than you actually think it's going to take, no matter how much preparation you do, you know, you've got to be very, very prepared for basically seeing the, the uh, job of capital raising as an always, always on job. It doesn't stop. So what I would say is that, you know, to, to those who contemplate a journey of trying to raise capital with VCs, it's so important, number one, to make sure that you understand yourself and the stage that you are in 
as a company so that you don't meet a whole bunch of people who are investing at the wrong time. How, having said that, there is no doubt that you will do 100 meetings and you will get 99 no's and you will kind of like continue to learn and change your story and, and, and react to uh, you know, all the signals that VCs are saying. So you've got to be very, very adaptive. But don't think that you just do, do a, a fundraising journey and then you just uh, stop so you can build your business. You've got to do it whilst you're building your business. You know? So for example, look, we're at the stage of, you know, in the process of closing a round, I expect to go back out in market to raise the next round in about five or six months' time. So it doesn't stop. It's, an, it's a never-ending journey. Uh, and it's, it's also a, a mental journey, uh, as well as like something that is, it, it, there is no prescription. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, Be prepared for the 100 meetings. Awesome. Well, some fantastic learnings. I know it's been a very quick fire panel, um, but you know, I, I spoke to a few attendees just out um, in the foyer earlier on, and an awful lot of the questions that they were asking me about what they wanted to get from the day, certainly I think this panel has, in, in a very short, succinct way, um, got across. So hopefully um, each of you has taken something from that. So um, thank you very much to Paybase, to Risk, to uh, Blue Code, and to Amplify. Um, can I have a big round of applause for everyone? Thank you. Excellent. So thank you very much, guys. We're going to switch over to the second group of four growth companies. Yes. Excellent. So this one here is more focused on, you know, we, we're, we're so used to hearing what went well, um, you know, hustling and um, killing it and striking out well and everything. What, what we wanted to do here is take an angle on learning some fundraising failure stories and what each startup here took from those stories. So um, I'm just going to invite each startup on and then we're going to jump straight in and tell a, tell a story um, that will hopefully give each of you um, a learning that you can take away as well. So Seed Legals, can I invite you on? Seed Legals is the one-stop platform for all the legals that you need to grow your, grow your startup. Thank you, Seed Legals. Secondly, we have Tuki. Tuki is an AI-driven virtual workspace to optimize knowledge management in organizations. Thank you, took it. Um, next one, we have Omnitude, Yuri. Um, Omnitude is the gateway for enterprise clients to take advantage of blockchain technology. Thank you, Yuri. And finally, we have Submer. Submer is, quite simply, hyper-efficient, ultra-dense, next-generation data centers. Gone for the casual approach here as well. Perfect. Great, so I'm going to jump straight in because I think we're, we're also um, um, pushed for time, obviously. So um, I'd love to start just basically with you, uh, Paul. Um, okay. Could you tell us something that's happened in your, in your, um, in your experience at Submer uh, or outside of Submer that went wrong that you learned from? And um, I would say that there are three things that I could have done much better. Um, one of them is running for or looking for investors in uh, one after the other. Somehow, um, I didn't did it in parallel at the beginning. So one of the main things or takeaways would be to be able to somehow create the momentum and uh, at the beginning test with maybe not so relevant investors your initial pitches and your initial conversations and try to improve as soon as possible your, your presentation and your pitch. And from there, trying to tackle them in parallel. Because it, they, want, they don't want the picture. They want the, uh, basically, roadmap of the evolution of the company. And they want to meet you one day and then follow on uh, over time. No? Another one would be the target of the investors. Uh, I was traveling all over the world, uh, US, uh, around Europe, etc. Uh, I ended up getting an investor local, a local investor, very founder friendly, very happy with that. But uh, if I optimize the target uh, audience and I was uh, maybe looking at Crunchbase, uh, looking for the specific um, um, portfolio, uh, speaking with, with uh, stakeholders, etc., would be uh, much quicker. And then finally, the background checks with the investor. Uh, I think it's very important to also uh, basically network with the stakeholders related to this investor or the investors that you are interested in. For instance, the uh, founders from existing portfolio companies and checking what the day-to-day what the -day operation with them is, the, how 
uh, they operate in good and bad times, and uh, maybe other co-investors that usually invest with these investors to see how they can do the follow-on investments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we've been, um, apart from learning from the mistakes, we've been very, very lucky, and now we are very happy. But of course, this is something that we could have done much, much better. Excellent. Thank you. And um, at Omnitude, have you had any particular experiences that have been, you know, a real horror story that at the time you thought, how are we going to get out of this or, you know, what's happening here? How, what, how are we going to deal with this that you've then kind of um, learned a lot from and capitalized on? Is there anything in particular that springs to mind? Yeah, absolutely. I actually want to take it back to one of my first conversations that I had with, with, with investors. Um, the pitfalls are many. Um, especially if you're slightly in inexperienced. Um, and in this sp specific scenario, uh, I was trying to oversell. Um, I had probably about four or five different opportunities that I was trying to bag into one, uh, thinking the more I can offer uh, this investor, the bigger the opportunity is going to look like to him. Uh, needless to say, before I could finish, uh, he kind of excused himself. Um, so my takeaways from that, and it's something that I've experienced through various stages of investments and money that I've raised for, for, for different companies. Uh, investors invest in people in the first place. Secondly, they invest in that person's or that, those people's vision and then follows your marketplace. So don't just focus on your product. They want to see who you are as a person, as a founder. What is your vision? What is your drive? So the key points that I would say to take away from my experience, from pitfalls to avoid when you're looking for investment, is be confident about yourself be confident about your product. If you don't believe in your product, you can't expect an investor to believe in your product. Be very clear about who you're going to sell to and how much of that market you're going to take. And the answer of, I'm going to take 95% of this market by year two, normally doesn't go down well with the investor. And the last point I would say is be realistic about what you're asking for. If you a startup, don't try and overvalue yourself. At the same time, don't undervalue yourself. Thanks. That's a tough balance to find, right? It's like Absolutely. a bold vision, but not too overconfident. I think it probably varies based on where you're from as well. I think yesterday we had a day dedicated to the top startups and um, we had a couple of investors who'd been over in the US and also over in the UK, and they said, you US founders uh, have a lot more confidence in their future vision uh, than, than British founders. So everyone does it slightly differently, but it's a tough balance to get, right? Um, Absolutely. And I think that at the end of the day, if, if, if you are confident in your product, in yourself, and in your market, that confidence will carry over onto the investor as well, and he will start believing in you. Awesome, thank you. There are a lot of clear learnings there, so thank you very much. And Tuki, I'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah, um, so my, uh, our story is a little bit more disturbing. Um, <laughs> so um, first of all, our current investors, they always say that a failure for a startup is just a way to find one more, one more way that doesn't work. So a failure is totally part of the process, that's fine. We got 40 no's before we got one yes, and you only need one yes to get invested basically. So my story is about uh, the common ground of partners uh, in a VC firm. So um, the story began about uh, two years ago when one of my friends gave my contact to one of the uh, investors in Israel. We are Tuki, we are from Israel. Um, and uh, he said he's a great guy, you should meet with him, it will be amazing. I met with him like three times and he always tried to explain to me what to pitch to the other partners. Uh, what to tell them. Once we will get all the partners on board, what I need to tell them in order to grab them all together and to get the relevant funding. And they were um, used to invest between $600,000 to $1 million, 
and uh, we were just looking for uh, 250, something like that. And um, he said, that's okay, we'll, we'll make it work, don't worry. Uh, that was amazing. It's nothing that we did, what we did two years ago is nothing like we do right now, but that's uh, <laughs> a different story. Um, and then uh, when we came to, to the meeting, he said, okay, this is your presentation, those are your slides, this is what you need to say, uh, this is the amount of money that you need to request, and it will be okay. And then I came up to the meeting, and of course we prepared ourselves for about a month to meet to this meeting, all focused on that, my partner, and my, my, partner, my partner and I in the garage, and uh, we were super excited, and we basically put it all our cards on this meeting, because it should be okay. And then I started the meeting, 10 minutes after pre the presentation, one of the other partners stopped me and said, we are not investing those funds. And uh, I said, okay, and I didn't want to burn the other partners, I didn't say anything. And then he said, and then the other partner said, um, I think you should bring us something more reliable, like show us a demo or something. Like that. And the other partner said, you don't even need a demo. So the thing about VCs, which are great people, they are nice, they are building businesses, um, they have their own agenda. And every person, every partner has his own story. And what you need to find when you get to those people, you need to find the common ground of all the partners that make the decisions. You need to find the stakeholders, what they believe in, why they believe in it. And to be very straightforward and to st st speak always about the common ground of all the partners all together. Don't touch any soft spots that you know that will be problematic to other people. Don't speak about things that you think will be not relevant to one of the partners because then he will grab his phone and start working with his phone while you're pitching. And try to be uh, really honest about the things that brought you into this process. And that's it. You will definitely succeed. I'm 100% sure of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Love that. And um, just now onto seed legals. I know that obviously uh, you've probably got some stories from yourself as well, but I know that your customers are startups, so you must also have potentially some stories from them as well. So um, looking yeah. forward to hearing this one. <laughs> yeah, so we've had every single permutation of horror show um, pretty much ever from our, from our customer base, but they're all solved now. Um, but um, the one that really sticks in my mind is first time founder, they came, they were really excited, they were raising a pretty small amount of money, and they had their first term sheet, which they signed. And they think, okay, this is great. Um, that was actually really easy. I re outreached to a few investors, got a signed term sheet. But actually, when they came to us and we looked a little bit closer, it wasn't a term sheet it was effectively an agreement for the person, the other party, to fundraise on their behalf and take 7% of the amount that they raise. So super, super bad um, actual outcome, especially when you think that you actually were about to close some money. So first point is actually read everything litigiously before you ever sign it as a founder, particularly in early stage fundraising, because you know, we get a little bit blasé about you know, portioning a percentage here or there. But it actually comes on to the wider point, which is on sort of paying for intros. And normally there's a little bit of debate on these panels about whether there's a place for paying intros or not. And I'm not saying there aren't some great people that can work on your pitch deck, that can do your financial modeling or, or like that. And obviously these guys have to be paid in the rapture round. But there's a definite contingent of people on LinkedIn that kind of masquerade as investors. And they say, yes, uh, I will be interested in investing in your round, but Better than that, um, if you just pay me a couple of thousand pounds a month, I can introduce you to all of my investor network and your funding round will be filled before you know it. And of course, it doesn't work that way. Why would any rational investor ever take the word of someone that's only being paid to make that introduction? Now, um, and I think basically in the worst case scenario, you have ended up, you know, getting, well, the slightly worst case scenario is you end up not getting anything for your money, but even worse than that, if someone just spams a load of investors on your behalf as part of this kind of relationship, um, there's only a finite number of people that you can target, right? And it's really important that you own that relationship early on and don't do anything to ruin it. And a lot of the time, that's the mistake I see founders make more than, more than any. Awesome. Well, I think on that note, we've got to, we've got to wrap up. But um, thank you so much for your stories. And I hope all of you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, thank you very much once again to our startups. Do make your way upstairs when you've got some time and speak to them because they're great people and great companies. So thank you again. Thank you.